<laughs> okay, folks, uh, you can see that okay? Um, let me know if there's any problem. <clears throat> um, so today the plan is to discuss um, optical selection rules and scattering. Um, and I was hoping to be able to skip the optical selection rules, you know, because I introduced that concept last time, but I looked in your book and I thought that the treatment your book did was pretty bad. And, and I looked at other books and I realized that they were most, they were all mostly pretty bad. So I realized that my treatment is actually the best one. So I'll show you my treatment. Um, and so let's, let's discuss optical selection rules. So, <clears throat> so this is where we left off last time. Uh, here's a, here's a flashlight with a thermal filament, hot filament, sending out light at all different frequencies. This could be the sun, for example. Um, and here's an atom, like you, you're made out of atoms. And your atoms have ground states, I'll call the initial energy, and then there's excited states, and the electrons can jump up when they absorb photons. Um, we did this all last time, so I'll go through this part really quick. Uh, we have a total energy density of the, the electromagnetic energy density, ut, which is one half epsilon naught e squared, where that's the electric field, not energy. And we, um, that's the total, but then we say, we say that the energy density, we can break it up into uh, a spectral density, where that is the spectral density. Spectral density is equal to energy per volume per frequency. <coughs> um, and then if we make all these definitions, then we say, then we, it's easy to show, and we did that last time, that the, the rate of transitions, and I should say that this is optical transitions, optically induced transitions um, is R. So we go from the initial state to the final state. Uh, and it has a, and we calculate what it is. It's, it's pi over two epsilon naught h bar squared um, times the um, dipole matrix element that connects the initial and final states squared times the energy density at the frequency, uh, the energy density that can link the initial and final states. The energy density at the frequency that links the initial and final states, omega naught. Okay, <clears throat> and so then we see then that the most important thing, or one of the most important things, is the dipole matrix element. And the dipole matrix element is defined as this. It's the it's the dipole operator uh, links the final state and the initial state, and and it's it's charge times position because that's the definition of the of a dipole. That's the electric dipole. Electric dipole. You remember that from E and M. P is equal to the sum over all charge times the position of all charge. That's the definition of the electric dipole. And if I just have one electron, one charge, then it's just the charge times the position of the charge. Um, okay, and so then we see that, um, and of course this comes from, uh, this all comes from the fact that the uh, perturbation H prime is equal to charge times electric field dotted into R. That, that's where this is all coming from, the perturbation due to the, elect, the electromagnetic perturbation. 
Okay, and so then what we say is that the selection rule, so we say that transitions um, occur when uh, the dipole matrix element connecting two states does not equal zero. And so when this happens is called, this is determined by the selection rule. The selection rule tells us when this happens. In other words, when the dipole matrix element does not equal zero. That's what a selection rule is. It's just saying when the transition can happen. And so let's so let's cut so let's let's find the selection rule. Let's find the selection rules for optical transitions um, in an atom. Optical transitions in atoms. And the reason why that's important is because everything is made of atoms. <laughs> Everything is made of atoms. I mean, you know, like if you go to the sun, it's maybe a big plasma of nuclei and electrons. And, you know, like maybe a dwarf star is not made of atoms because everything's condensed into neutrons or God knows what. But I'm just saying uh, in, in our world on Earth, you know, in, at room temperature, everything is made of atoms. And so in our world, in our lives, atoms are the most important things uh, because we are not weird plasma creatures that live in the heart of a star. We're just normal carbon-based life forms. Uh, okay, so for carbon-based life forms, atoms are the most important things. And so this is a very then very important uh, concept. When do atoms absorb light? Because we want to know how, when, when is it possible for us to get a tan? Because that's the most important thing. Um, and so let's figure that out. When can you get a tan? Um, so here it is. The tanning rule is that we have to calculate um, calculate when this dipole matrix element does not equal zero. So then let's find it. Let's find this. Find that matrix element. So let's calculate it. So this is what we got to do. Then let's do it, and let's do it for atomic states. So this is not the selection rule for every state. This is just the selection rule for atoms. Okay, so you know there might be different selection rules for different kinds of states and for different kinds of systems. But we're going to calculate it for atoms for atomic transitions. Um, okay. So then what we have to do is we have to find uh, we got to let's calculate this thing, which is uh, I got to have a final state. I got to have my um, Let's do it. We're going to do it for electrons. And so we know the charge is minus E and the uh, operator is R and we have an initial state and we got to find this thing. And so first let's define these states. Um, so we're going to have a, a final state is going to be, um, it's going to be my, um, let's do the initial state first. The initial state will be some atomic state, N, L, M. And the final state will be some final atomic state, N prime, L prime, M prime. And the whole point is, uh, the whole thing we want to figure out is for what N prime, L prime, M prime does uh, this dipole matrix element not equal to zero? That's the question. So let's calculate it. And so here it is. P F I is equal to minus E. Uh, we have the final state, N prime, L prime, M prime. We have the position operator and the initial state. Okay, so this is what we got to calculate. Um, and so setting it up is not so hard, uh, but calculating it is, is quite tedious. There's a lot of math to do it. So a lot of math. 
So um, let's do the math. Um, so then <clears throat> what I have to do is it's an integral, right? Matrix elements are always integrals. It's an integral. Um, it's an integral in 3D. Uh, and so let's write it out. And so here it is. It's going to be, um, I got the charge minus E, and it's going to be an integral in three dimensions. And uh, what uh, we're talking about atomic orbitals. So what coordinate system are we going to use? Somebody tell me. Spherical. Exactly. Because there's spherical symmetry. And so let's use spherical coordinates. Um, and so let's do, uh, uh, okay, so it'll be, I mean, so it's gonna be a volume d cubed r, and then I'm gonna have my, um, my psi uh, n prime l prime m prime, and I'm gonna have my, my, my operator, that'll be complex conjugate, uh, and then I'm gonna have my initial state n l m, and that's it. Okay, that's the integral. So it doesn't look so hard when I write it like that. But now let's write it in all its, its true glory. So it'd be negative e three integrals. And so the d cubed guy, well, first let's just remind ourselves a little bit about spherical coordinates. I got x, I got y, I got z, I got uh I got my r, I got my uh, I got my theta, I'll drop this down, I got my phi, um, and then this guy, uh, what is this guy? That guy's going to be my r cos theta, and, and then this guy is going to be my r sine theta, and then I'm going to have my I'm going to have my x, which is our sine theta times what? What's x? Our sine theta times what? Cosine phi. Exactly. And then I'm going to have my y, which is here. God, it's such a pain y is equal to r cos theta times what? Times what? Uh, isn't it sine theta sine phi? Or? No, I don't think so. Because, or is it? Oh yeah, you're right. Thank you, that was my, my mistake. Thanks, uh, r sine theta times what? Sign five. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, yeah. And so that's it. Okay. So, um, can we get on? Yeah. Uh, skip that. Okay. So, um, okay, good. So we got all, we got our coordinate system all laid out. Um, let's erase this and do it a little bit lower. Uh, equals negative E. So now we got our little, um, um, okay, so we'll, I won't worry too much about that. So the, the volume in spherical coordinates, I have, um, well, it is useful to, I mean, we're gonna do this again in spherical, so uh, in scattering. So it is useful to kind of remind ourselves a little bit about all this spherical coordinate stuff. So there's my R. And you know, I have my little, my little bitty area, and it's like a little bit of volume, right? That's my d cubed r, my spherical volume, and then I have these these edges of it, like this edge of my little, because if I want you guys to picture this, you know, it's like I got the spherical position vector and it moves around, and it traces out a volume, and so to trace out this little bit of volume. Uh, then this little edge is going to be, uh, that's theta and that's phi. 
And so do, do you know what this little edge right here is? That little edge? It's a length. I'll call it uh, DL1, for lack of a better word. Does anybody, can anyone tell me what that little length is? R D, D theta. Exactly. And then I got another little length right here. I'll call that DL2. What's that little length? Um, I kind of see what you were pointing at, but is it? Um, oh, it's this one right here. R sine theta D phi. That's right. And then this little vertical guy right there, this little length right there, what's he? DR. That's right. And so that means then that D cubed R is equal to, uh, I'll call that D A, little bit of area times D R, where area is D L one times D L two, these lengths. So it's, it's kind of simple. It's like, you know, volume is equal to area times, you know, area times thickness and area is length times width. Uh, and so this then is going to be equal to uh, add it all up and you're going to get R squared sine theta D theta D phi DR. Okay, and, and I know that you guys all knew this, but I'm just reminding it to you because the, we're going to be using this spherical geometry more. So this is like a little spherical geometry review. So now uh, PFI is equal to uh, negative E. Now I got to do my I gotta do my thingy. So now let's do that. So this is the uh, integral that we're gonna do now right here, this guy. So let's do him. And so the volume element is gonna be R squared sine theta, D theta, D phi, D R. That's my little volume element. And, and the R goes from zero to, what's the units? Or what's the distance? R goes from zero to what? Infinity. That's right. Phi goes from uh, zero to what? Two pi. And theta goes from zero to what? Pi. That's right. And if I took this little part right here, sine theta d theta d phi, what do I call that? Four pi. R squared. Okay. Well, if I integrated it, it would be 4 pi, but right now it's not integrated. It's still in differential form. What do I call it? D omega. Right. The differential solid angle. Differential solid angle. Uh, and, and that's because uh, D cubed R is equal to... Um, I could write it like this. I could write it as r squared d omega dr, where r squared d omega is equal to what? <laughs> this is really getting. I'm going deep into the spherical stuff because we're going to use it for scattering. But what is r squared d omega, where d omega is differential solid angle? It's the DA we were talking about earlier. Perfect, DA. Just a little thing, uh, D uh, R squared, uh, R squared D omega equals uh, D uh, R squared D omega equals DA, right. Okay, good, I just, and so I, and so I could also say that d omega is equal to dA over r squared. So that's sort of a solid angle definition. Okay, guys, so I'm sorry for all this uh, spherical stuff, but we're gonna use it soon uh, anyway. So let's continue with this uh, integral. So now I'm gonna have uh, psi um, n, psi star n prime L prime M prime here. And so that guy is gonna be my canonical um, um, atomic orbital, I have a radial part. Um, and now I multiply it times <clears throat> the spherical part, right? The angular part. 
so this is my uh okay so that's <clears throat> that's my uh final state and now i have my my operator r and now i have my initial state which will be psi n l m and so that's going to be r n l of r oh it's not a vector no it's it's a it's just the coordinate r uh, times y l m theta phi. All right, that's it. We did it. Yay. Okay. So that's the integral that we have to solve. Okay, that's it. And so it's pretty straightforward to set up, but solving it is 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 kind of a pain. But let's solve it. Let's let's go through the details. And the only reason I'm going through these details is because it's such an important result. I want you to see it at least once in your life. Everyone should see this at least once because it's so important. Uh, and so let's write it all out. Um, but before we write it out, let's uh, notice something. Let's notice that we can take this R here and we can write it uh, like this. R is just x times x hat plus y times y hat plus z times z hat, right? Uh, but then we're going to do our little trick because we notice that um, we can also write r because we have x. And so remember, we did all that x, y, z stuff. Where did we do it? Like here's x, here's y, and then, and then here's z. So we know we can write x, y, and z in terms of spherical coordinates. And so x uh, is going to be r sine theta um, cosine phi. And I multiply that times x hat plus y, you know, this part is going to be uh, r sine theta sine phi. Uh, y hat plus z is r cos theta z hat. Okay, so that's r. And, you know, I'm sure you guys have done this in some class, one or another. But now there's a little trick. There's a cute little trick. Now we'll do a little math trick. And I'm going to skip the algebra, but I think it's pretty self-evident that we can write this as... Um, square root of four pi over three times the radial coordinate r. That's not too tricky, but now check it out. Z hat uh, y one zero of theta phi uh, plus minus x hat plus i y over root two times y11 one one of theta phi uh, plus x plus i y over root two times y one minus one theta phi. Okay, so, I mean, that's not totally obvious. I mean, you wouldn't have probably come up with that on your own unless until someone showed it to you. But now that I've showed it to you, uh this is actually pretty simple to figure out i mean the step to go from here to here just just look it up in a book just look up the y you know what is the definition of y10 y11 and y1 minus one just look look them up in a book and when you look them up in a book and you screw around with the algebra then you can very quickly see that this is true what i wrote okay so that's not hard it's tedious, but not hard. There's a difference between tedious and hard. Um, okay, so so this is now our our, our uh, position operator. And so there's something really interesting to notice, which is sort of not obvious, but I mean, you wouldn't have thought of it before, but now when you're staring at this thing, you know, now that someone has shown it to you and you're staring at it, there's something very interesting that sort of jumps out at you which is that this position operator, you can sort of think of the position operator as having angular momentum. And um, 
And so this position operator, if, if I was to ask you, what's the angular momentum of this position operator, what, what would you say? And I am asking you, <laughs> what is the one angular one. momentum of it? One. Right. It's associated with angular momentum one. And, and, and so that's a little bit weird, you know, because normally you think of states as having angular momentum. A state, you know, like the, you know, the, the L equals two state of a hydrogen atom. You know, you think of this, that so far up until this moment in time, you've always thought of the state as having the angular momentum. But now I'm also kind of showing you that an operator can also, in some sense, have angular momentum. And, and that's not really a crazy thing because it really has to do with the symmetry. You know, uh, when you, when there's different ways of defining angular momentum, but one way of defining it is to say that the angular momentum of an object sort of uh, is defined as how it responds to different uh, rotations. You know, so if I rotate something with L equals zero, then that means it's unchanged. If I rotate something with L equals one, that means I have to rotate it through certain angles for it to come back on itself. And so th that's like a different way of thinking about angular momentum. And so if you think about angular momentum as defining how something reacts to rotations, then it makes perfect sense that an operator can be thought of as having angular momentum because when I rotate the operator, it behaves this, the same as an L equals one object. So maybe that's maybe that's a little too fancy, but that's that's the way it is. And so those are the kinds of things that you learn in group theory when you when you study group theory. But we're not going to do a bunch of group theory. But I just want. But even without knowing group theory, you can just stare at this with your untrained eye, and you can just see that, well, my God, you know, R looks like it has angular momentum. It has L equals one. Okay, so that's pretty interesting and cool. Uh, but now let's continue with our uh, little sojourn here of math. So uh, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna plug it in. All right, and so we're gonna plug it into the integral, and let's grind through it. Plug it into integral and grind through all the tedious details. Let's do that. Uh, sometimes that's just what you got to do. And this is one of those times. Okay, so now let's write it out. And so we plug it in. And when we plug it in, this is what we get. Uh, negative e square root of. And I think that you can sort of see why I was hoping to skip this whole thing. <laughs> you know, I just, just want to say, go look it up in a book. But then when I looked up in the book, the books were all really lame. And so I couldn't tell you that. So we got to go through it ourselves. Okay, you plug it all in. Um, and then we get this. We have a, uh, uh, we're going to break up that integral. I'm going to skip a couple. I'm skipping a line of algebra, but it's no big deal. It's easy. Oops. Uh, I'm, there's nothing tricky. When I say it's easy, what I mean is there's nothing tricky. So let's, we're just plugging it in and, and do some multiplication and I'm just skipping a little bit of multiplication. So that's the radial part, okay? And now I'm gonna multiply it times this. And so this is a gigantic integral, so I'm gonna write it over different lines. Uh, so this multiplies So this multiplies this, and um, here I'm gonna have z hat times the integral. And now to make things a little easier, I'm gonna replace the notation theta phi with omega, just meaning solid angle. It's just easier. It's just notation. And so, um, the notation is just a little easier. So d omega, so we're integrating over solid angle, y star uh, l prime, m prime, which is a function of solid angle, y one zero, omega, um, and then y l m omega. Okay, that's the, that's, okay, so that's, that's the first one, but then there's going to be another one, which is um, this. It's going to be 
minus x hat plus i y hat over square root of two times the integral of d omega y star l prime m prime of omega times y one one of omega times y l m of omega. And then the third part is going to be um, x hat um, plus i y hat over square root of two is the integral over solid angle of y star l prime m y1 minus 1 of omega and ym of omega. Okay, so that's the beautiful integral. Okay, that's it. So it, this is not tricky. I'm just grinding through it, just plugging one thing into the next. So that's the integral. And so, but now let's take a look at this integral. Let's just kind of remind ourselves, I mean, you know, where all these pieces came from. Like this, remember, this was the final state, remember? Final state, that part, and this part came from, where did this part come from, remember? Where did this y1 minus 1 stuff come from? We're Someone writing R. Exactly. That came from the position operator. Exactly. And what, what about this? Where did that come from? the initial state. That's exactly right. I just want you guys to remember what, what this all is. And then, so now I have these three, well, actually kind of like four integrals. So let's just look at these integrals one at a time. Let's first look at the radial integral. Um, now you might be tempted to think that the radial integral equals zero because the radial functions are Hermit polynomials and they're orthogonal. But that would be false. <laughs> Why does this not equal zero? Can anyone say? The extra like R's that we have. Exactly. Too many R's. This, this little guy, okay? So that's, there's too many R's and so it's, no, it's not just a simple uh, orthogonal integral. It's not just a simple integral of two functions. I got those R's in there. And so this thing in general does not equal zero. So let's not worry about him anymore. So there's no, there's no selection rule there. That, there's nothing interesting in the radial part. It's just some bizarre integral that has no interesting properties. But these angular ones are quite interesting. They have very interesting properties. So let's look at these. We got to look at these three angular integrals one at a time. So let's give them names. Um, I'll call this one integral one. I'll call this one integral two. And I'll call this one integral three. And let's look at them each individually. And <clears throat> let's do, so let's do this. Um, let's, let's break up the integral that now normally you would say, okay, well, this is really great. This is just like an orthogonal integral, but the reason why it's screwed up is because a normal orthonormal integral, you would have two, <laughs> you would have two spherical integrals. And if there are two spherical harmonics, then you'd be like really happy and it'd be simple. But the thing that's messing us up is that there's the fact that there's three, right? Three that's messing us up. So, let, but, but there's a trick. We're gonna take these two guys and we're gonna group them together, these guys, and we're gonna use what is known as the uh, addition theorem. Okay, we're gonna use the addition theorem. So what is the addition theorem? Let's talk about the addition theorem. So let's consider, it's not really a consideration, it's more of a memory. Let's remember 
that um, let's remember addition of angular momentum. And when we add up angular momentum, we remember that when we have angular momentum one, um, and when we add it to angular momentum two, then we remember that the total angular momentum um, can equal um, L1 plus L2, uh, L1 plus L2 minus one, dot, 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 all the way down to what? Someone tell me. Absolute value L1 minus L2. Perfect. That's right. Um, and then we remember that the total angle momentum state can be written as a sum over all the product states. And those product states are L1, M1 times L2, M2. And, and then we have a sum over all the product states, M1 and M2, right? That's, that's what angle, that's, that's the change of basis because that's what angular, that's what addition of angular momentum is. It's simply a change of basis. That's what addition of angular momentum is. It's going from the product, it's going from the product state to the total angular momentum uh, basis. Okay, but there's a trick here, which is that there's a constraint on M1 and M2 because M1 plus M2 equals what? M total. Exactly. It's a constrained sum. <clears throat> we're adding, we're summing over all the M1 and M2, but special M1s and M2. It's all the M1s and M2s that add up to M total. And, and that's what you remember. And then the C, what's the C called again? The C factor? It's called a what? Klebs Gordon? That's exactly right. It's a Klebs Gordon coefficient. And how do you get the Klebs Gordon coefficient? How do you get it? How do you find it? Table. What? Table. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Table. Exactly. Perfect. You look it up in a book. That's exactly right. Okay, and so, and the Klebs Gordon coefficient will depend on a bunch of things. It'll depend on the total angle momentum, the total of the Z component of angle momentum, the ones that you're adding up, L1, L2, and M1 and M2. So it's quite a pain in the ass to look those things up, but it's not that hard. I mean, if you had to do it, you could. If someone put a gun to your head, you, you could do it. Um, okay. So that's, to, that's addition of angular momentum that we remember. But now the whole point of the addition theorem is that what we can do now is what we're doing here is we're writing the total angular momentum state as a sum over product states. But what we can do is we can invert it, which should just kind of make logical sense. We can invert this process and we can and then we what we can do is we can do the opposite <clears throat> and we can say and this should not come as a surprise to you uh it's just a simple inversion so that means if if this true is true then that means that i should be able to write any product state <clears throat> as a linear superposition of total angular momentum states i think that that's not a very far-fetched concept where now I'm, I'm summing over uh, uh, L total and, um, and I'm summing over M total and I have some constant times this state L total M total. See that? So that's the inversion. Uh, but now there's a constraint because I'm summing over all L possible L totals, but and also uh, all possible M totals, but M total is constrained. What's M? What's the constraint on M total? 
M1 plus M2? Exactly. And of course, L total is also constrained to the usual thing, which is it, it goes between L1 plus L2 dot, 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 down to L1 minus L2, right? So we, these are constrained uh, sums. And this C, here's the big kicker, this is just the same Kleps gordon coefficient. L1, L2, M1, M2. And that is the addition theorem. Kind of an obvious thing. It's sort of like, it's intuitive. You know, the exact statement might not be obvious, but it's, but the, the gist of it, I think, is pretty obvious. It's just an inversion of the definition of addition of angular momentum. If I can go one way, then of course I can go the other way too. So, but it's really quite beautiful because what it's telling us then is that the product, because these are spherical harmonics, right? Because if I take the state Lm and I project it onto the state omega, that means to be at a particular solid angle, then this object, this this overlap is equal to what? What is this thing equal to, this object that I've just written in terms of bras and cats? What is it? Y L M. Exactly. That is the definition of a spherical harmonic, okay? That is, that is what a, a spherical harmonic is. Kind of some issues here with my stupid thing. Um, okay. That is a spherical harmonic. Okay, so that's the definition of a spherical harmonic. So, so this thing that I've just written is a, um, so this addition theorem is a theorem regarding spherical harmonics. And so what I can do then is um, um, just simply apply this, 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 this addition theorem to spherical harmonics. And so basically I'm gonna apply it now to the case at hand, which is that um, um, I'm gonna write it like this. If this is true, then if, then if I have this state, one M prime, um, and if I have the state Lm, then using this theorem, then I know that this is gonna be equal to C1 times L plus one M prime plus M. Actually, I'll write it here so you guys can see it. Um, now I'm using the addition theorem plus C2 um, L um, M prime plus M plus C3 uh, L minus one M prime plus M. So this is just using the addition theorem. From the addition theorem, I can write this down. And so, and the reason I wrote it like this is because that is our integral. See, let's go way back to our integral. You see, I have these product states. This is, this is the state one zero times L M. This is the state here, one one times L M. And this is the state one minus one times L M. So what you see then is that these states that we're looking at are gonna be the states of one M times L M. I want you to see that. So that's what these guys are. And so using the addition theorem, I can write this as a, as a sum. And that's what I've done right here. One. And so what that means then is that I can uh, rewrite. <clears throat> what, what that means then is that using this trick, I can rewrite 
for, so remember I have these three integrals. It's a lot to write, but you see I had these three integrals. Um, one, two, and three. And so for those three integrals, the important thing for integral one was I have a y10 multiplied times a ylm. And so that then I can write as proportional to, I'm gonna forget about the constants. I'm not gonna worry about these klebs gordon coefficients, but I just want you to understand the, the, the gist of it. Uh, y10 times ylm is, is proportional to, using the addition theorem, y l plus one uh, m plus some constant times y l m plus some constant times y l minus one m. And similarly, using the addition theorem for the second, applying it to the second integral, I have y one one times y l m. And that's proportional to some constant times uh, y l plus one m plus one plus some constant times y l m plus one plus some constant times y l minus one m minus one. And then the third one similarly is is going to be y uh, one minus one times y l m is proportional to h times y l plus one m minus one plus some constant times y l uh, m minus one plus some constant times y l minus one m minus one. Whew, okay, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if you're still following, but that's what we get from the addition theorem. So the whole point is that we took the product of spherical, spherical harmonics, and now we can write them as a single, as individual spherical harmonics. So now we're gonna take these guys and plug them into the integral, plug into the integral. And what you're gonna see is that these guys then are all going to get integrated up against this y l m y l prime m prime so all those guys i just wrote down there are all going to get integrated up against the same thing the final state you see what i'm saying the final state um and so so now these guys get integrated up against this the final state l prime m prime of omega and uh, and all that all these guys get plugged into here and so this equals what and so if i do that integral now you can see that this integral equals zero unless Unless L prime equals what? Can someone tell me? L plus one or L or L minus one. L plus one or what? L. Or what? L minus one. And at the exact same time, I need something else. I need m prime to equal what? m plus one or m or m minus one. That's right. That's exactly right. And that is the selection rule. That's the selection rule. The selection rule is that delta L, which is equal to the final L minus the initial L, has to equal plus one, zero, or minus one. And delta M, which is equal to the final M minus the initial M, has to equal plus one, zero, 
or minus one. But there's one further little nuance, which is that, and the further little nuance is that um, it turns out that if delta L equals zero, then you can show that the integral uh, y star y, you can show that this thing is equal to zero. Uh, and that's a, that's a homework problem. Homework problem number 9.13 in, in your book. Okay, so, so that means that the final selection rule is that delta L is equal to plus or minus one and delta M is equal to plus or minus one or zero. That's the selection rule. Okay, guys, we did it. Ah, pretty exhausting. Jeez, it took a whole hour. Um, so uh, I just want to say that this is often interpreted, and I'm not going to get into this, but this is interpreted as saying that photons have L equals what? What's the angle of momentum of a photon? Somebody tell me. Is it zero? Uh-uh. Good guess. Um, What's another guess? H bar k. Uh, no, that's the that's the that's the spin of an electron. That's close. Though. That's a good guess. I'm talking about a photon. Is it one? Yeah. Because you see, if I because the selection rule is for absorbing or emitting photons. That's a physical interpretation of the selection rule. And so you can see that if, if I absorb or emit a photon and delta L is plus or minus one, that means that the photon has angle momentum one. And so if I absorb it, then, then my L gets bigger. And if I emit it, then you can think of my L as getting smaller. All right, so that, but I'm just, I'm just telling you, that's how this is commonly interpreted. Now, in our treatment, we've been using time-dependent perturbation theory. And so our treatment has no photons. Uh, so, but, but if you actually did <clears throat> the calculation correctly using quantum electrodynamics and field theory and all that stuff, you would get the same answer. And that theory actually does have photons. And then you would actually see that photons do have any momentum, but our, our treatment is too simplistic, but I just want to point out that our treatment is consistent with the correct theory. So, uh, or whatever that's worth. Um, okay, so now let's look. Let's can, I, can, I, can, I, can I ask yeah. a really fast question? Yeah. Um, I would think, like, naively, that y star y, if the two y's are the same, integrated over all the spherical coordinates should be one, because isn't that how we normalize them? Yeah, and one is not zero. And so that's right. So the, the, whole, the whole point of a selection rule is, when is the integral zero and when is the integral not zero? And so the point is, is that the, if those subscripts are different, then the integral is zero. It's not a question of whether it's one or not. The question is whether oh, it's- Oh, I, I meant uh, just scroll up a tiny, tiny bit. This equation here, if delta L equals zero, y star y d theta is equal to zero. Are those not the same y's? Oh, I see. So let me do it like this. Hold on a second. Yeah, maybe I was being a little sloppy here. Then P F I equals zero. Okay. I was being a little sloppy. All right. So this is this is the statement. And if you want to understand it better, I want you to go to homework number nine point one three. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Okay. So the, the, the point is that the selection rule says that the dipole matrix element is zero if delta L is zero. And that's not completely obvious from the treatment I just gave you, but you would have to look at it a little bit more closely to see that, all right? And, and to see that you need to go to homework number 9.13. Okay, because I am showing you all the details, but I only, I can only stand so much of the details, you know? It's like just too many goddamn details. Um, all right, so, uh, but let's just do a quick example. Um, <clears throat> gotta do an example. There's many possible examples. There's some in your homework, but suppose this. Suppose I did this, check this out. This is really interesting. 
let's take a hydrogen atom and let's let's this is my ground state one zero zero now let's go to the the ex, the first excited state uh n equals two and for n equals two i can have a l equals one and i could have a m is equal to one zero minus one so suppose i go into this state right here suppose i'm living in this state and that state is the um, uh, psi two zero zero state. And my ground state is the psi one zero zero state. Okay, so this is a very reasonable thing. I'm sitting in the state psi two zero zero. All right, and that's a completely reasonable state for me to sit in. And here's my ground state beneath me, psi one zero zero. So now I'm gonna ask you a question. Can I fall down and emit a photon? So can I go from psi two zero zero to psi one zero zero by emitting a photon? That's the question I'm asking you. No, and no, right? Because the L's are the same. Delta L equals what here? Zero. Zero. Right. And so that means that my dipole matrix element connecting the initial and final state is what? Say it. Zero. Zero. Right. And therefore, there's no transition. That's a cute little result, huh? That means that if I'm up there, I'm stuck. And so that means that the lifetime of that state, does that state have a long lifetime or a short lifetime? Long. Exactly. So that's a long lived state. Okay, that's the only example I'm gonna do because now it's time to move on. <laughs> we really beat that to death. And I wanna at least be able to introduce the concept of uh, scattering to you guys. Okay, all right. So that's all I wanna say about that. Now's the time to ask any quick little last questions, if you have any. Um, but if not, then we're going to go to the new topic, which is scattering. Scattering, yay, we're going to do scattering. Ah, scattering. Uh, I like scattering. Um, <clears throat> normally, you think of scattering when you think of like high energy experiments, you know, like, uh, like, like going to CERN and do scattering of big detectors and accelerators. And, you know, normally you think of scattering, we talk about high energy physics, but I don't do high energy physics. I mean, I, when I was an undergrad, I actually did. I worked at Slack back when it was a high energy physics place. I actually did do uh, high energy physics as an undergrad. I dismantled the time projection chamber at the positron electron PEP site something or other, I forget. Um, but no longer, now I'm a condensed matter guy. And so you might think that condensed matter people don't care about scattering, but that's false. Because uh, scattering is really important for high energy and condensed matter and, and everything, atomic physics. Um, but it's also, it's important for, um, for condensed matter physics. It's also important for atomic physics, I'll call it AMO. It's also important for biophysics because in biophysics, you have to do a lot of light scattering. And so I'm just, I just wanna make a point that scattering is really important for base, essentially every aspect of every field of physics. And it's just, it's a really important, uh, even for soft matter physics, it's important. It's important for everyone. So, you know, sometimes, because when we talk about all these concepts like what is a cross section? You know, that's a scattering concept. What the hell is a cross section? What is a differential cross section? These are scattering concepts. And these concepts are important for every field of physics. And that's something that I didn't really know as an undergraduate. I always thought that this was just like high energy stuff and that I didn't need to know it as a condensed matter guy, but, I, but that's totally wrong. I've used scattering tons of times in my research. All the time uh, it comes up and so, I just want to emphasize the importance of this topic. And so that's why I actually 
take, I actually do a pretty serious job on scattering in this class. So I, I, I get really into scattering. I think it's a great topic and really important. And I remember as an undergraduate, I did not appreciate it. And it wasn't until later when I did research that I realized, oh my God, it's everywhere. Scattering is so central to everything. So, so I just want to say that to you right now, uh, that as a condensed matter guy, I think it's a central topic. Um, okay, so what is scattering? <clears throat> Enough, that's the introduction. And so let's talk about what it is and, and what it means and how to use it and all that. So scattering, okay, so scattering is basically, um, what, there's different ways of thinking about it. One way is you can think of it as the theory uh, of uh, eigenstates with uh, positive energy. So that's like a definition of scattering. And, and what does that even mean? Why would I say that? The reason I say that is because look, here's like a canonical quantum mechanical system, a uh, potential. And so usually you think of the energy here as zero, and here the energy is less than zero, and here the energy is greater than zero. Now down here in the energy is less than zero region, the states are, are well, how would you describe the states? in the energy is less than zero region. Bound states? Exactly. Quantized and bound. That's exactly right. That's what they look like. They're, they're quantized, they're bound. What does bound mean? Like what's your definition of bound? Like we say bound, but what does bound even mean? Someone give me a definition of bound. Your potential energy is like more negative than your kinetic energy is that's positive. Co that's correct. That's right. That is a that is a feature of bound states. But what does bound mean? The word bound. It's like they're stuck. Yes, stuck. That's exactly right. They don't move. And you guys might not have thought about that much, but a bound state cannot move. So like I cannot describe the motion of a particle using bound states. They don't move. And we'll talk more about that, but it's very profound, they don't move. Uh, but up here, I have uh, E greater than zero. How would you describe those states? What are they like? It's a continuum of Exactly. Right, I have a continuum of states. I have a continuum. And so that's something that you guys have thought about and, and that you know, but there's also something very profound about the continuum states. That is because those states move. A particle described by continuum states, you can move. And when I say move, what I mean is you can describe the motion of a particle with continuum states. That means that if I have a particle that's moving through space, in order to describe its motion using physics, the language of physics, I need to use continuum states. I cannot describe the motion of a particle without continuum states. And maybe no one's ever told you that before, but now I'm telling it to you. And so what that means is that eigenstates with energy greater than zero <clears throat> are pretty important because that's how we describe things that move, all right? And so without scattering, things will move. And so the theory of scattering is the theory of eigenstates with energy greater than zero. It's also the theory of um, another, it's also the theory of continuum, continuum states. And it's also the theory of stuff that moves. These are all the same thing. These three things are all the same thing. So I could describe scattering as the theory of eigenstates with great energy greater than zero, and that's correct. I could also describe it as the theory of continuum states, and that would be correct. And I could also describe it as a theory of things that move. In other words, if you want to describe something that's moving through space, you cannot describe it using bound states. You have to describe it using continuum states, using the theory of scattering. And that's why it's so goddamn important because things move. Out in the real world, things do move. You know that, you experience it all the time. 
you often see things moving and you cannot describe motion of particles without scattering. So that's why it's like so central. It's like, geez, okay, you know, it doesn't get more profound than that. All right, so let's, just, so let's try to understand it because we want to understand why and how things move. It's just, it's that basic. All right, so uh, you've already done this. So you've already done scattering, already did it. Are those my pants? They're my pants. No, they're my but pants. Um, uh, hey, hey. Oh, okay. oh. Whoever's out there, pants. you guys got to turn that off. Pants. Here are my pants. Uh, okay, so we already did it. Um, we already have talked about, you guys have already done scattering, and you did it already in one dimension last year. And you've already done this. You already have an idea of it. Because in one dimension, you did this problem. You had this. You have a potential well. And what you did was you had some, um, you, you did this. You, you gave an energy greater than zero. You said, I have a particle in a potential well. And the energy of my particle is greater than zero. Let's put the zero here. And then you said, um, you, you said uh, on the on the right, I have a incident wave. I'll call it e to the i k x, and that wave can hit that potential and bounce back. And that's and that you call the reflected wave, e to the minus i k x. And then I got a guy here that can come through, and he is called. Uh, T e to the i k x, and what is he called? He has a name. He's called the what? Transmitted. Piece. Exactly. So this guy is the incident wave. This guy is the reflected wave, and this guy is the transmitted wave. And so you guys did this. But I don't think you. But you did not use the language of scattering when you did this. Um, I don't. You probably did not. I mean, I don't really know what you did, but most people don't use the language of scattering. And the reason that you don't. <clears throat> well, well, first let's just say let's just remind you what you did do. You solved. So um, you solved for T and R. And how did you do that? How did you solve for T and R? Do you guys remember what you do? Uh, you did like, well, in e and we did like, we matched like X components and Y components or something like that. Exactly. You, uh, you matched the wave function and the derivative of the wave function at um, the boundaries, okay? Like here, like, you know, this, you could call this guy, you know, x equals zero, and you could call this x equals L. You know, you, you, you did it at the boundaries, x equals zero and L. So you guys all did that. So I know, I know you all vaguely remember doing that. Okay, so you did do that. And then, <clears throat> and then remember, you, you, you had this thing, you said the probability to reflect equals what? Uh, would it equal like one minus the probability of transmission? Yeah. But what is that? Well, I guess that, you, yeah, but what is that in terms of the given parameters that I've written down on this page? What's the probability to reflect in terms of stuff that I've written on the page? Somebody tell me. Square. Say it again. Would it just R be R squared? Square? Exactly. Exactly. And then the probability to transmit is equal to t squared. And of course, you, you got to do one or the other. And so the probability to, to reflect or transmit is equal to what? Equals what? One. Exactly. Conservation of probability. That's right. Okay, so you guys did this. So 
this is a problem that you know. And so this is scattering in 1D. This is scattering. But it, but now normally, as, as in this course, we've done this already many times, normally I'd say, let's do it in 1D and, and generalizing it into 3D is trivial. That's like the word I like to use. It's trivial. It's so simple. Just trivially generalize into 3D. And that's true for bound states. Whenever we're talking about bound states, going from 1D to 2D to 3D is usually pretty simple. And uh, the description doesn't change very much. But for scattering, for continuum states, this is the one case when it's not true. Going from the one-dimensional case to, the, to generalizing into the three-dimensional case is, is a huge leap. They just are totally different. They look very different. So that's scattering in 1D. So you did that, but the generalization to 3D is really hard. Generalizing uh, to 3D is not easy. It's not trivial, non-trivial. So the generalization of scattering from this very simple problem that you solved last semester to the more generic, the more general 3D case is actually really hard. It's really, it really looks very different. So uh, that's a point that I want to make. Uh, but despite that, I want to connect. I want to connect the 1D case to the 3D case. And I want to sort of, I want you to see a connection because the reality is that they're real, they are the same problem. The 1D case and the 3D case are literally the same problem. Uh, and I think it's helpful to see that because the three dimensional case, it looks so different and the language we use is so different that it's easy to lose sight of the fact that it's re we're really talking still about the same physics as the 1D case. So I want to use the language of scattering to describe the 1D case. So so that's what I'm going to do now for the next few minutes before class is over. I'm going to, I'm going to reinterpret this one-dimensional problem in using sort of the language of scattering. So using the language of scattering, let's think of this. You guys probably remember this thing. Um, this concept, you, you guys all learned it, probability flux. You all learned it in your class last semester. And you guys remember that probability flux J is equal to, and you just derived it using some clever derivation that you all went through, but you probably don't remember, uh, but you did derive it. Uh, H bar over two mi times psi star <coughs> d psi dx minus psi d dx psi star. And you guys all derived this and then you probably all promptly forgot it because in one, you know, it's just like a, it's just like a curiosity in one dimension. Everyone learns it in undergrad and then they promptly forget it and no one seems to care about it anymore. And this probability flux is equal to probability per time. And you learn that. Um, and, uh, but then you kind of forgot about it. But, but now I want to bring it back because it turns out that this is a central concept in scattering. And you can't really understand scattering without using this concept. So it turns out that this is really important, even though when you learned it, you, no one probably told you that. They probably didn't tell you how important it was, but you can't understand scattering without really internalizing this concept of J, the probability flux. So I wanna bring this back, this concept, and emphasize it because the thing is that probability, and because, and you can see how this sort of, connects to other concepts that I've used in this class, this idea that probability is stuff. Probability is like water. It flows. Probability moves. It flows. It's like stuff. And that's how you should think of it. Don't think of it as just like this abstract statistical concept. Think of it more like stuff. Probability is, is stuff. Um, and so, and this is, this is sort of an equation that's telling you probability is stuff because it's flux, it flows. Probability flows like water. And that's not, and that's really true. It's not just an analogy, it's really true because I can write down an actual equation for the flux of probability, it flows. And that's the equation. So using this equation then, I can start thinking about probability. So now let's start talking about 
the probability to transmit the to reflect reflect and transmit using this language of flux what's the probability to reflect and transmit so this is the way to think about it let's say that i have this i have this barrier in 1d so the way to think about it is i have my i have my incident flux j incident that's my my incident flux like water it's probability and it's it's this equation that i'm talking about let's think of it like those arrows that's like flux because flux is arrows right and so now it hits this thing and when it hits it some of it bounces back one let's say the top arrow and the bottom arrow bounce back but let's say that these three other arrows go through so this is like a flux representation of the one-dimensional scattering problem so you see that this is my incident flux <clears throat> this guy here is my reflected flux the arrows that got reversed and these arrows are my transmitted and so from this so just from looking at this picture that i drew i'm asking you a question what is r squared tell me i'm asking for a numerical number like 0 0.7 somebody tell us that's exactly right 0 0.4 What's t squared? Zero point six. That's exactly right. And so, what I want you to do now is use. So, so this is our. So already, it's intuitive. So, what did you just say? What you just told me? What you just did in your head? And it was actually not hard. Is you did this? You said that the probability to reflect, which is which is the probability to scatter, because reflection is scattering, by the way. <laughs> the probability to reflect is equal to, this is what you just did. You said it's the J without the barrier, and you subtracted the J with the barrier, and you normalized in your head to the incident flux, J without barrier because that is the incident flux that's what you just did and it's so simple when you see the picture but when i write this equation it might look really complex but you did that and you got that number 0 0.4 that's what you did but i want you to say i want you to see something which is that if you actually calculate the j without the barrier and you and you plug into this formula i'm not going to do it it's really simple to do but if you just use these wave functions see these are the wave functions here the the wave function on the left here psi is equal to e to the i k x plus plus r e to the minus i k x here and here i have psi is equal to t e to the i kx and so if you actually calculate the j's then you're going to see that the j um, um <clears throat> the j incident is let me see uh, the j without the barrier so if you actually calculate these j's then you're going to find that but when you calculate these j's uh, then you're going to have J incidence uh, minus the J on the left side divided by the J incident. <clears throat> and the, and the, let me get this right. For J incident, you're going to use this psi is equal to e to the i kx. For j on the left, 
then you use psi equals e to the i k x plus r e to the minus i k x and j on the right side we're going to use psi equals t e to the i k x if you calculate the j's from those sides using this formula and i don't have time i'm running out of time but if you plug these wave functions into this j formula and then you calculate this quantity you're going to get what somebody tell me somebody tell me the probability to reflect is what two-fifths but but now in, in equations i did it this graphical formula you're right two-fifths but now in terms of equations because remember the wave function is is the wave function is written in terms of R and T. The R and the T are what describe the scattering, the reflection and transmission coefficients. So what, if you actually calculate these quantities and, and subtract them and normalize them the way I show, what do you think you're gonna get? An equation. I'm, I'm looking for an equation. Would it just end up being R squared? Yes. And I want you to go do it. And if you do the same thing, and then this is the last thing I'll do, probability to transmit, do the same thing. The probability to transmit is going to be J without the barrier. And you did this, just if you look at that little picture, you see it's going to be, I'm sorry, it's going to be J. Let me get it right. It's going to be J with the barrier divided by j without the barrier. It's going to be the flux with the barrier divided by the flux without the barrier. And if you calculate that, you're going to see that that's equal to t squared. And so I want you guys all to go home and think about this, to actually do this calculation and think about this flux uh, picture of, of how we think of the probability to transmit in terms of these fluxes, because that's going to really help you to understand scattering. Uh, and that's it. Okay, folks. Um, bye bye. See you Thank later. You. Thank you. Bye bye.